Cool. Um, well, I just literally just finished watching the movie. That's a bit of a mind fuck. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah so yeah that's quite fresh in the mind um right i'll begin because i know i haven't got too long today uh what what was the initial attraction to getting involved in this project i mean i've not seen anything like this for a long time when you got the script did you have a similar experience of thinking yeah i've this is very unique and original oh yeah i mean you said it man it was a mind fuck <laughs> i mean i i kept trying to tell my wife the whole time i was reading i kept stopping and being like you don't understand. This is crazy. Like, none of this makes any sense. <laughs> I kept being like, I mean, you read so many linear scripts and some scripts that like really highlight the subtext to a point where you're like, you feel like, like the nail is deep in your skull by the time you're like 30 pages in. And with this one, I kept being like, they don't, don't give a fuck what the audience knows. Like, they really don't care, man. They are just like, we're out at sea, <laughs> we're floating. Maybe there's a shark around us. Maybe it's a whale, maybe it's a dog. We don't know, there's fins in the water and like, there's no sign of land. And they're like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I loved it. And I loved it also because there were elements that I was like, okay, I recognize that trope. I recognize that storyline. Like Glenn is offered this kind of indecent proposal, sort of like, you know, offer you should refuse, but can't refuse because your life is so dull. And this sort of thing comes up all the time in movies. And then it becomes the thing in which the movie is wrapped around. And in this case, it was just a stepping stone. And so you're given these little nuggets of like stories you've seen before. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build my base here. I'm gonna sink, I'm gonna put my stake in the ground. And on this, on this piece of land is where I will build my tent and it won't blow away. And then it's like, oh no, that didn't that didn't fucking matter. That was just a piece in the that was just like a floating buoy. That's gonna sink, man. Don't put your anchor on that. And so it's great because it, as an audience member, you're continuously like, okay, now I know where it's going. And then it's the rug's pulled out again from underneath you. And um, and I, you know, the thing I really love about it is that so many sci-fi movies and shows that I love that I get involved in have third act problems where. The concept is great. The setup is great. You're like, oh my God, I'm totally into this world. But then the third act basically ends with one character chasing another character with a gun and like a car chase. And you're like, okay. So the concept really didn't matter in the end. It's just that. And the thing I love about this is that the concept is, is kind of revealed to you in the third act. Like you don't really know what this world is. It's, it's, you're trying to figure out what the concept is. Like, it's not clear. And so because of that, it's, you're kind of, your brain is forced to reverse engineer everything. And, and, and in a way, kind of like, kind of like memento or primer, kind of put the pieces together um, retroactively, you know, and, uh, or reverse engineer them really. And so the concept stays strong all the way through the third act. And it, it sticks with the story. It doesn't revert to another genre. It doesn't revert to action. It doesn't revert to, you know, um, drama or any of those or a love story. It kind of stays with its sci-fi principle, its mystery principle. Yeah, maybe I'm a masochist, but I, I've realized obviously there's a niche for films where the, the director just doesn't give a shit about what his audience cares and knows, which I quite, which I loved about this movie. But you, you mentioned you sort of spoke to your wife about it, but like, how have you gone about describing? I'm mean, assuming, you know, when you're making something, family, friends will say, hey, what are you working on, Vincent? With, in this case, how did you condense <laughs> what this was to, to, to people that asked? So poorly. So poorly, like not even to, not even to beat around the bush. Like I called up a sibling of mine and I was like, yeah, so I'm doing this movie and okay. So it starts here and then this happens. And then, and then like 20 minutes later, I'm like literally 15 pages into it. And I'm like, you know what? Just forget about it. I can't describe it because what happens is you start to describe it and then you realize you have to reveal what it's about. And so in revealing what it's about, then the person kind of gets ahead of the story. And then the story kind of loses what makes it, what makes it special, what makes it the story. And so then you go, okay, but rewind, forget all that stuff I just told you about what's really happening and pretend you don't know any of that, but um, you can't really, you know? So 
I did a really poor job of describing it to everybody. And in fact, even when, you know, uh, Rob called me up and said, hey, you know, uh, I'd love for you to, you know, be a part of this project, even talking with him about it was difficult, right? Like two people who had read the script, even talking about like conceptualizing how we were going to get that onto the screen became a conversation that like was very difficult to have. And um, I would try to express kind of, you know, oh, I have this worry or I I love this thing about it. But then like trying to explain that to him was difficult. And for him trying to reassure me or change my mind about something was difficult because the subject matter is so elusive in a way. Um, but uh, I, I was impressed with him when, when we were on set that he was able to, uh, that he was able to keep everything in his mind and I think he's like a really calm person, the director, and he has a very like wonderful um, quietness about himself and a wonderful kind of inner dialogue that you can kind of see. And I think it took someone like that to kind of be able to put on the horse blinders and just kind of know the story, kind of like the story was just continuously playing in his head and he was just very aware of what he needed to what he needed to get and what each scene needed to convey in order for him to kind of like organize the puzzle at the end. Yeah, I mean, maybe it is because I've only watched it just quite recently, but I almost feel like I need to have a shower after. There's a kind of unsettling kind of feeling to this. Was that that tonality to the movie, that fit, that feeling of kind of un, un, unease that exists the whole way through this? Did you get a sense for that on set or is that something that's kind of built on in, in post? Yeah, no. What if you're if the question is like, did did people on set have the feeling of unease, like on a personal level? Then no. Uh, oh if no, that I was the question. If no, the question no, was I, like, no, I meant, I in meant, regards yeah. to the content we were creating. Yeah, 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 yeah. In regards to the content, yeah. No, not really, because you. I mean, yes, in some scenes, right? Like um, the scene in the hotel. I'll be really vague about it because I want to give anyone who's listening or reading or watching this the opportunity to like not know anything about it, but like the scene in the hotel, right? Where she brings me into the hotel, like definitely there, where like we're trying to put pieces together. There's a sense of unease because we're in this situation where we're stuck between different thoughts, right? So there were definitely scenes where like we were able to heighten the unease, but in most situations, it's important for the characters not to be in unease. I mean, other than the fact that like certain situations are awkward just in themselves being awkward, right? Like the the first scene where he first meets her or the scene before he goes to her bedroom, right? Like those scenes are just awkward because they would be awkward in real life, but not uneasy awkward, just kind of like uncomfortable awkward. Um, and in most of those scenes, as the, as the character, you have to fully believe in that moment, right? That moment has to have full credibility. It, it can't be kind of shadowed by any sort of um, doubt. I'm yeah. being vague, but I think you know what I mean. I know, yeah. <laughs> but Glenn's backstory kind of feels intentionally held back. But as an actor, do you create it yourself? Are you one of those people that gets the script and just goes, right, I'm going to go with what's on the page? Or do you like the whole kind of process of building a whole world before the, the film's ever, ever begun? A, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. I mean, firstly, it always depends on the project. And it always depends on... I mean, if you're doing one scene in a story, some actors are going to tell you, you know, they need to know everything about that character from birth. And that's totally their right. And other actors are going to say, well, I just need to know how my character pushes the story forward, how my character affects the lead character or the, the person who in this story is, you know, a bigger character than mine, how they're affected by me, right? So if you're playing a shopkeeper in a mysterious bookstore that the lead actor comes into looking for a book and you're supposed to be creepy maybe it is important that you know why you're creepy that you were molested as a child in the priesthood maybe that's really important to you and maybe other actors are going to look at it and say well from a technical standpoint i just need to make sure i hit these notes these tones and so every actor is going to take that on in a different way and um for me with this with this kind of story where i'm playing one of the leads i would say it is important to know a bit of his backstory and at the same note to to um, not go so deep into that, that it becomes um, distracting. 
And in saying that, I, I mean, his backstory is one that is quite average, right? This is a, a guy who never stood out in school. He never, he never left and, and took a big shot, a big swing at life. You know, he didn't take over dad's business or go out on a epic trek to find himself in the wilderness of Bolivia. He never took those risks in his life. He, 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 he has a, a, a standard job where he gets a, a paycheck and, and he goes home to a very simple apartment and, and his life is um, uncomplex, but without, without the peaks and, and valleys that can give a life meaning and without the responsibilities that give a life meaning as well. And so when certain responsibilities come his way, he's given a meaning. I mean, the, the responsibility, the, the opportunity that comes his way when this woman comes into his life, and I think you know what I'm going to, the ultrasound of the thing is, okay, now I can step up. Now I have something to live for, right? It gives him purpose. Does, if that if that makes sense. And so for the character, he needed to be a man without purpose, right? If he had a driving inclination to be a titan of industry, then we then it becomes a different story completely. I, I, I know, obviously. You I don't know. know if that answered you. I don't even really remember you. No, <laughs> that's fine. No, but I, was wondering, do you, I mean, do you think that there is something quite yeah. oddly enticing about living an uncomplex life? Because I know, obviously, you, you say responsibility is great and coming and, and these kind of great adventurous moments that arise are what makes life so special. But some there's, is it, can you see the appeal in that kind of more stripped back, uncomplex lifestyle that he like? The, Fuck that, yeah, man! <laughs> <laughs> totally, absolutely. I mean, one of my one of my personal fantasies through my twenties was that like I would be like a nighttime janitor in a high rise, like this idea of just like pushing around a big like you know, rug cleaning tool with my headphones on with all the lights out and looking out over the lights of the city. And then you pack up your big thing at the end of the night and put it in the back of the van and work is done. And when you go home, you don't think about it. Like you never think about it. Like you, you don't worry like, oh, I wonder if I really got that carpet clean tonight. You know, like, like if you have a job where you're putting in a lot of your own energy and there's a lot at risk, your job never really ends because you're kind of constantly wondering like, could I have done better or we, 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 you know, was that note that I was given or that critique I was given that I really digested that I really work it into the project, you know? And, and so, yes, as somebody who's kind of done this for a long time, I oftentimes have looked at those lives and goes, God, God, that's great. And I'm not saying that a simple life doesn't have meaning at all, but I'm saying that, you know, people often, even with kind of simpler lives do, do take on at some point in their life, other responsibilities, whether it be a family member that's sick that they take care of, a mother, a father, or whether it be children of their own or a charity they care about or something like that. And and I'm not saying everybody does. There's definitely people who don't, but, um, and Glenn is one of those people who hasn't yet, right? He doesn't have really a family. He doesn't have anyone he, who he's spending time on. He's He's going to work, he's going home, he's watching TV, he's going to sleep. And I'm not saying that that's a life void of meaning and it certainly has its own meaning, but it's a life void of responsibility. And for this particular character, when he's given the opportunity to have responsibility for him, it, it seems like it will be a driving force in his life. I can't pretend to speak to what make other people happy. But for Glenn, I think he's missing something. He's forgetting. He There's something in his life that feels incomplete. And as often happens after you go to a wedding, I mean, even if you don't want to be married and you don't want kids, and I was that person for many years, when you do go to a wedding or you do go to like a baby shower, or the you know, the birth of a kid, there's a part of you that's like, you know, at least there was a part of me that would that would always be a little bit like, gosh, am I, am I missing out on something, you know, is, you know, I don't have that thing, you know, and I'm driving home to my PlayStation, you know, and like <laughs> my bong basically. You know? uh, my, my final question before I go, even though I could speak for hours uh, is, um, I mean, you were obviously in a, a little known 
TV show, Mad Men. Uh, that I that obviously uh, I was late to the party and binged over the last like year and thought it was one of the best things ever. I just wanted to ask you about because Pete Campbell is a bit of a dick at times, which is obviously a testament to your performance at how unlikable he can be, particularly in the early series. I just wondered if you ever experienced fanfare going too far, people almost blaming you as a person for his shortcomings. Not too often. I mean, most people are, most people get it, but I think what happens more often, and I think I've spoken about this in interviews before, is that people don't know I'm that guy. Because I mean, it's been a while now. That show was out like what, seven, eight years ago now. And I'm, I'm older now. And I'm even less attractive, if you can imagine that. And, uh, you know, I usually have a beard and I have more gray hair and I'm fatter. And so lots of times people don't know I'm Pete Campbell, but they just don't like me. <laughs> and it might be because of my personality, which is a pretty viable reason. But I think every once in a while, people like make a snap judgment they don't like me because their unconscious bias <laughs> is like, that's fucking Pete Campbell. <laughs> but it doesn't tell them that's Pete Campbell. Yeah. It's just like, I know that's Pete Campbell. And that guy's a <laughs> dick. And then later that meal or that day or that week or that month, they, they're like, Oh, you're Pete Campbell. Oh, I'm so sorry for spitting in your burger. I didn't know. I just, the minute I met you, I just thought, I don't like him. And I didn't know why. So I've gotten that before. Um, yeah. But I think most people, you know, the, the, also the funny thing is that people, especially when the show was on, people would meet me and they'd be like, oh, we hate Pete Campbell and we love Don Draper. And I'd be like, but Don Draper's just as big as, of a dick as Pete Campbell is. The difference is that he's really charming, he's really handsome, and he's really cool. And so you excuse his dickiness. Some people do. Whereas like, if you're short and not so attractive and not very charming, you can't get away with being an asshole, <laughs> you know? Uh, Don Draper can get away with a lot. But anyway, uh, on that note, thank you so much for your time today, Vince. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. And best of luck with the movie. And I really hope that you can find a way to condense it, to, to, talk, about, to talk about it when people ask you what it's all about, because I'm still struggling. <laughs> well, it's out now, so I'll just tell them to watch it. Yeah, probably a wise move. Anyway, take care, man. Best of luck with the release. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys, Is yeah. that from the Goonies? Yeah, from the, yeah. Nice. Hey, you guys!